So with that, would you please open your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7. And this morning, we are continuing our look at Stephen's spirit-empowered witness, and it's quite a long and detailed witness. It's one I've been uh, just really in the text, wrestling with, trying to make sure I understand what Stephen is putting forth so I can lay it out before you, and I need God's grace to do that. Uh, This was a a real challenging text. I'd say of all the texts I've preached thus far in the book, this is the one that was really a challenge to lay out. And so I need God's grace just to help me present it to you in a way that you just eat it up and digest it and go, I don't know all that you said, but I got this. You know, and hopefully it's Christ-centered and going to help you in your walk with God. So let's pray and ask for his help. Lord, we just acknowledge our utter need of your spirit to work this morning. Um, We can sit and hear your word, but if your spirit doesn't attend to it into our hearts and give us the illumination that we need to see within it, not just your truth, but how that truth applies to us, we're we're without help, we're without hope. So please, Spirit of God, uh, exalt the Savior this morning. That's who is at the center, ultimately, of this text, showing us that he is the righteous one in whom we must trust, not the work of our hands. We offer nothing with our hands. Our trust must be fully in Christ, whom you sent, who's the chief end of the law. He's our righteousness. And so may you exalt him uh, through the word as it's preached. Help me in every way I need it, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. So let's do a little bit of a review Uh, the Jews in the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. It was a Hellenistic synagogue. It was consisting mainly of those who were um, uh, Hellenistic Jews. They were Jews who were Jews religiously, but culturally they were Jews out. They were outside of Israel Jews. So they were kind of foreigners to to, uh, the culture of Israel and Jerusalem, slightly different. And they formed a synagogue. And it was in this synagogue that one of those members, uh, another Hellenistic Jew by the name of Stephen, who came to see Christ as the Messiah and put his faith in him. And as he continued to speak about Christ and echoed the words of Christ about such things as the temple and so forth, well, just as it got Jesus in trouble, it got Stephen in trouble. And, And some of those from the synagogue of the freedmen chose to bring him up on charges before the Sanhedrin. And these charges are laid out for us uh, beginning in Acts chapter 6, verse, beginning in verse 11. And breaking them down, uh, these wicked men, and it tells us that these were false accusations. So they knew it was false, what, that what they were bringing forward. But, they, but Stephen had said enough that they could work with it and make it appear that this was really what he was saying, even though it wasn't. He wasn't guilty of these charges, but here's the charges that they laid out. First of all, they said, you're speaking against God and his temple. So follow along with me at the beginning with verse uh, 6, verse 11. We have heard him speak blasphemous words against, and he says, God, against this holy place, for we've heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place. So you see, I'm, I'm kind of truncating. I'm jumping around a little bit to lay out these charges. So the first charge is against God and his temple. And secondly, the second charge is against Moses and his law. We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against the law, for we've heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. Okay, so those are the charges in categories, God and his temple, Moses and his law. You know, for Jews, there could not be any more serious charges than that of blasphemy. According to God's law, blasphemy was punishable by stoning. Leviticus 24, 16 says, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord will surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. Uh, Was such a possibility in Stephen's mind as he was saying what he said that ultimately led to his standing before the Sanhedrin? Well, given what the Sanhedrin did to Jesus, I I think we can assume Stephen was aware of the possibility that this this trial, so to speak, could, could end poorly for him. But as you'll see, 
Luke never even hints that he was concerned for his own well-being. What concerned Stephen more than anything else, his life included, was the honor and the glory of Christ and his gospel. How could Stephen be so courageous before the same men who falsely accused and then orchestrated the murder of Jesus? Well, this is why we took time last week uh, to appreciate Stephen's character, to admire his courage. Right? We, we see how it was that he could stand before these men in the same manner as Christ because everything that Luke said that was true of Stephen was also true of Christ. Stephen was, <clears throat> in verse 8, full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Or, sorry, that was 5. And then in verse 8, he was full of grace and power. And this manifested itself in an irrefutable wisdom, which they could not cope with, and coupled with an unfaltering courage. We see, we see in this <clears throat> that, that Christ was, he was more than our Savior. Right? He was our example. Of what? How to live powerfully? How to live boldly for the glory of God? And Stephen is the proof that when we abide in Christ, like a branch abides in the vine, then Christ is pleased to fill us with that same strength of character and faith and power that he demonstrated. And we see it right here in Stephen. He was pleased to fill Stephen with great faith great grace, great power, and great wisdom to boldly stand before his accusers. Oh, do you need hope? Do you have, do you have, do you have troubling situations at work? Uh, we talked this morning in our first installment of probably 14 or so installments. In, no, uh, in Sunday school hour, we addressed the whole issue of same-sex marriage. And um, you got maybe a third of your way in. He thinks it's only going to take next week. I think it's going to take more than that. We'll see. Because everybody wants to talk, right? We're all concerned. Am I going to be able to rightly represent Christ in the midst of a culture in the way that it's going? Well, Stephen is your encouragement. Abide with Christ, brother. Abide with Christ, sister. His strength and power and grace and wisdom, he promises, it will flow through you. Now, let me begin by saying that the answer that Stephen gives has always been somewhat difficult for me. This isn't the first time I've read through Stephen's um, speech, but it's the first time I've had to study it in depth. And I would say that up until I began studying the details of Stephen's logic, my understanding of what Stephen was saying here in chapter 7 was essentially the equivalent of my understanding of taxes. I can do my taxes as long as it's not complicated. And if you come to me with, oh, yeah, but how do you work out this deduction and blah, 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 I'll be like, mm, let's talk to a, an accountant. Talk to Marcel. You know, don't talk to me about it. You know, this, that's how I felt about it. I, I felt like I had a basic understanding of what Stephen was saying here. Um, but when you got to the details, I wasn't exactly sure how he went from this recounting, as you'll see, of, of the history of Israel, including going through Abraham and then Joseph and Moses and, and David. And I could never quite figure out how he went from that history lesson to this scathing rebuke that we see all the way in verse 51. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. It was like, man, you just launched into this tirade, Stephen. I'm not following this build-up here. You know, one confusing aspect of Stephen's reply was that it, it didn't seem to make much sense in connection with what we've seen already up to this point taking place in Acts. For example, in the previous sermons by the apostles, we've seen that the clear emphasis of their proclama a proclamation of the gospel, um, it, was, um, it was on the resurrection of Christ, the death and the resurrection of Christ. But, but here Stephen, Steve, Stephen seems to have proclaimed almost exclusively his judgment. It's the first time we've seen this, really. Though he, he did somewhat preach the cross, he certainly didn't preach the resurrection, as had all the others before him. And apart from the resurrection, there is no hope, friends. You know, in a sense, it, it, it's as though Stephen, you know, he died in peace. He died seeing the Lord risen, ascended, reigning, but nevertheless, there seemed to be this little hope left for the nation of Israel at the end of what he was saying. 
In fact, the sermon climaxed almost with the idea that the nation of Israel had exhausted the otherwise unexhaustible mercies of God. That's, that's the impression you're left with. And I think one of the main reasons for Stephen's difference in his approach had to do the fa- with the fact that he was a Hellenistic Jew. What does that matter? Well, there's an old Chinese proverb that says that if you want to know what water is, don't ask the fish. In other words, total immersion deprives the mind of a counter perspective, and for that matter, an honest evaluation of what you're immersed in, right? See, unlike Stephen, the Hebrews, these ones who are bringing Stephen up on these charges were Hebrews. They were born in Israel. They were born in a world that was swimming in Judaism, in religion. Now, coming from the outside, coming from outside the nation of Israel, Stephen was able to assess the religious situation far more differently and with a different perspective than that of the Sanhedrin. Stephen was therefore, he was able to see something that that we can say perhaps even the apostles didn't fully comprehend at this point. What was that? The church was separated from the temple, and from all of its liturgies and all of the laws of Israel. They have to separate from this. Remember, up to this point, people are still attending the prayers in the temple and so forth. They, we don't know if they were attending the sacrificial rituals and things like that, but there's still a close connection between the Christian church in its early stages and the temple. And Stephen is saying, that can't go on. Not with what they believe, not with what it's proclaiming. Stephen could see that the days of Judaism were numbered. And perhaps he understood what Christ was saying in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, more than than his other brothers in Christ, his Hebrew brothers. He could see. And as we'll see as we look at his response, Stephen knew that, that God was not localized to Israel. The land had nothing to do with being a follower of Christ. Now, there have been those who've, who've criticized Stephen's sermon, saying it was dull, it's boring. In his commentary on, the, on, the, on this passage, uh, theologian John Stott, he, 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 um, he says this, many students of Stephen's speech have criticized it as rambling, dull, even incoherent. A good example is George Bernard Shaw in his preface to Androcles and the Lion, calling Stephen, quote, a quite intolerable young speaker and, quote, a tactless and conceited bore. He described him as having, quote, delivered an oration to the council in which he inflicted on them a tedious sketch of the history of Israel with which they were presumably as well acquainted as he. Well, however, I'm confident that after we look at what Stephen has to say and his logic, you'll see that, as I came to see, that this was... There wasn't anything about this that was incoherent, dull, or rambling, right? There wasn't a tedious sketch of of the history of Israel. Stephen knew where he was taking them, and so did they when they laid it out, when he laid it out. See, it was a masterful recitation of specific periods in Israel's past, which, which not only vindicated him of the charges that they were laying at his feet, but actually turned and convicted the judges. Stott observes with reference to the effect of Stephen's speech. He says this, what he did was not just to rehearse the salient features of the Old Testament story with which the Sanhedrin were as familiar as he, but to do so in such a way as to draw lessons from it which they had never learned or even noticed. His concern was to demonstrate that his position, far from being blasphemous because dis because disrespectful to God's word, it actually honored it. See, the result of his profound use of Scripture, it was to highlight with these religious leaders what they should have known, but in fact did not know. And in his reply, Stephen, the accused, became the accuser, ultimately charging the Jews with rejecting Moses and the law that they claimed to keep. See, they they had completely missed the point of the law. 
which was meant to show them their sin, their need of a Savior. And that Savior was Jesus. But, but instead of gladly receiving Him, they foolishly rejected and crucified Him. And in exchange for pointing out their stubborn blindness, they dragged Stephen outside the city and stoned him. And so we have Stephen arraigned before the Sanhedrin. And Luke says, as it were, that, that, that God shone some of his glory on Stephen's countenance as he listened to the false charges that were against him. And then the high priest turns to him and says in chapter 7, verse 1, he says, are these things so? Well, rather than merely pleading not guilty, Stephen used the opportunity to give a defense. His defense, however, it was, it was not as much of himself as it was a defense of biblical theology. And one commentator says that he did not mount a defense in the technical sense, for he was less interested in clearing himself than in declaring the truth so as to reach the consciences of his hearers. And perhaps Peter, years later, had Stephen in mind when he wrote what he wrote in 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. By recounting biblical theology as Stephen did, he was using the storyline of the Bible to show them one overarching truth of Scripture. And this is how I would sum up all that Stephen has to say. And if this is all you take away, praise God, it'll be enough. God rejects all who trust in the work of their hands instead of the perfect righteousness of His Son. God rejects all who trust in the work of their hands. We're going to explain what that means. You're going to know what that is referring to. He rejects all who trust in the work of their hands instead of the righteousness of His Son. Our hope of salvation is not in what we are. It's not in what we do. Our hope is found only in the righteousness of Christ who perfectly fulfilled the law and who is the embodiment of the temple. Salvation is not possible through our own efforts, but in receiving Christ as our Savior, as our Lord. And in the end, the tables are turned. The accused becomes the accuser, as I've said, resulting in the church gaining its first martyr. And one of those who was responsible for his death began to be drawn into the kingdom of God. And we can see God's plan for the church. It's beginning to unfold after this event. God used Stephen's courageous end <clears throat> as the event which would begin the worldwide mission of the church. So the wisdom with which Stephen speaks is the wisdom of Christ. He's the one who enabled Stephen to say what he's about to say. It's not enough that we, that we merely understand it, though. So I want you to listen with ears that are ready to apply. I want you to apply the wisdom of Christ from Stephen as we go through his account. Apply the wisdom of Christ from Stephen. Now, the first section of Stephen's speech, it deals with the calling of Abraham. He's the father of the Jewish race. There were many things that Stephen could have said about Abraham. Genesis devotes quite a bit of real estate to the story of Abraham. But Stephen is selective. And it's in what he selects to say, the summary that he gives, that, that points us to what Stephen is about. So look at with me at verse 2. And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when, we, when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives, and come into the land that I will show you. And then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him moved to his country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect, 
that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, And uh, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And, and so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. You know, much like John the Baptist in his day, Stephen was speaking to Jews who have utterly misunderstood the significance of Abraham. They saw their physical connection to Abraham as a means of guaranteeing their place in the kingdom of God. And simply because they could trace their roots all the way back to the patriarch, they they saw themselves as blessed by God no matter what. Nothing, though, could be further from the truth. So Stephen, therefore, he, he chooses to begin by, providing, uh, by proving that, that God's presence had never been limited to a, a geographical area. Not even Mount Zion, where the temple was built, where the temple is standing as he's speaking to them, where he's standing on the temple mount in the, where the Sanhedrin meets, the very place where Abraham offered his son as a sacrifice, Stephen says God has not limited his He's going to show them that God has not limited his presence just to here. So his first point is this. God called Abraham in the land of the Gentiles. He says in verse 2, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And the God who revealed himself to Abraham in Mesopotamia, well, that was no less a revelation of God than anything that might have been given in the temple. And then to further emphasize his point, that that God's presence is not associated with any one place, Stephen then reminds them that God God never gave Abraham even any of the land of Canaan. Verse 5, he says, he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. Right? And in addition, he says, Abraham's descendants, who I'm also making this promise to, they're going to live in a foreign land for 400 years. That's Egypt. And so Stephen's first argument is to show the fundamental difference between the Sanhedrin and Abraham. They saw their righteousness by by looking backwards to who they were related to. They gloried in their flesh, in who they were. They, They pointed to external things, things like circumcision as evidence of their favor with God. Abraham never saw it this way. He never saw it this way. Circumcision was a sign of God's promise of something to come. Right? The, the author of Hebrews is the one who, who, who shows this best. He, he says this in Hebrews 11, verse 9. He says, by faith, talking about Abraham, by faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. See, he wasn't wasn't looking to the land as it to mean something. He was looking to God in faith, the one who'd made this promise to him. Where the Sanhedrin was trusting in external symbols, Abraham trusted in God. He knew God's favor. Paul's the one who, who, again, lays this out in Romans 4. He says, with respect to the promise of God, He didn't waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Abraham was saved by faith, not by circumcision, because this was, he was even called before he was circumcised, Paul points out. Circumcision had nothing to do with Abraham's righteousness. It was his faith. So Stephen's first point is that in or out of the land, God blessed his people. And that blessing was tied to his promise, not to a place. So don't put your trust in anything else but his promise. He doesn't promise to bless you because you're a member of a church. You know, before God saved me, when I was maybe around 11 years old, I had a brief stint where I went to a church where they preached that you had to be baptized in order to be saved. And I believed in God, I believed in heaven, I believed in hell. 
um, but I didn't know him. And I can still recall the day when, when I came home from church afraid because I had heard a sermon. And all I knew from that sermon was not that I needed to run to Christ for my salvation. I needed to get baptized. That's what I came away from the sermon with. Baptism, does, baptism doesn't save you, friends. Christ saves you. Baptism is merely a picture. But if I, I was ready to put my trust in getting baptized, just baptize me. Dunk me in the water. I don't want to go to hell. No, God saves you. But not because you're baptized in Jesus' name. His greatest blessings, His eternal life, the forgiveness of sins are for those who trust in His Son, not in something that we do. Now next, Stephen talks about the patriarchs of the Jews, the 12 brothers who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. So you see his progression here, starting with the inception of Israel. Now how about the inception of the 12 tribes of Israel? But in particular, though, Stephen highlights one. He he, he focuses in on the blessings of Joseph. So look at verse 9. He says, The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into slavery. Yet God was with him. And he rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it. And our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. And then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all the relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. From there, they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. So Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery into the hands of the Gentiles, the Egyptians. But what does it say in verse 9? Yet God was with him. So much so that, that, that was God with Joseph that he says that he rescued him from all his afflictions. He granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. And from that exalted position... We, if you know the story of Joseph, it was from that position that then he saved, essentially, the world. So much like Abraham, Stephen is reminding them that God blessed Joseph in the land of the Gentiles. Six times, Stephen emphasizes the fact that Joseph and his family were located in Egypt. And yet the Lord preserved, and didn't just preserve them, he blessed them because they grew to a great size. Stephen was building a case that the Lord had always been moving with his people and that his plan was never merely about getting some parcel of ground and stopping there. The temple was not God's ultimate goal. Now, Stephen also introduces another argument. He starts it here, but he's going to hit it even harder when he's about to talk about Moses in just a few minutes here. But it's worth mentioning here right now. And the second part of his argument is, did you notice what happened? The very first thing he mentions about Joseph, he was rejected by the patriarchs, by his brothers. He says in verse 9, the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph, sold him into slavery, into Egypt. So he's beginning to show now that throughout the history of Israel, the Jewish people have been guilty of something. They've been guilty of of persecuting and killing the prophets and the leaders that God sent to them. And it began here, we see it first of all, is with Joseph's brothers persecuting Joseph. He could have made his case from the the, uh, minor prophets and so Jeremiah, he could have made much of this. He starts with Joseph and he ends his argument with Moses and before he gets much farther, they're they're like, and they're They're taking him out and stoning him. I'm sure he could have kept going with his argument, right? So there's more that we could make of the case, but he's he's making it clear enough. So from Joseph, Stephen, then he moves on to Moses. With Moses, Stephen goes into greater detail, and partly because of the two charges that are against him, but also because Moses really was the hero of the Sanhedrin. He was the one they were greatly concerned about. 
Moses was the one through whom God had given the law, and, and these leaders built their whole lives around their version of keeping the law of God. And while he continues to use Moses to prove the points that he's already made, that God's presence was never confined only to Mount Zion, he also emphasizes, and this, this is now the rejection of Moses, the rejection of Moses by God's people. So in, in the aftermath of Joseph's rule over Egypt, it says that a new pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph, found himself with a rapidly growing crop of Israelites within his, the boundaries of his land. And so from 19, verse 19 down to verse 30, we're, we're essentially told the story of how Jesus was raised in Pharaoh's household by his daughter. That's in verse 19, how he then came to identify himself with the people, the Israelites that he'd come from, that's verse 23, and then even defending one of them, resulting in his killing an Egyptian in verse 24. Now, as a result, he ends up fleeing Egypt. He flees as an exile, an exile, and he goes into the land of Midian, where he marries and then begins a family. So we're going to come back to some of these verses in a little bit, so, uh, but I, I want to get to verse 30, and we'll return in a, in a minute here. Because I want to make the same point that we've already seen made with Abraham and with Joseph. And that is that God presented himself to Moses in the land of the Gentiles. Look at verse 30 where he says, After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the, Lord, I am the God of your fathers the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look, but the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. If God presented himself to Moses in the desert of Midian, outside of Israel, then the temple did not physically contain God. That's what he's saying. And so to preach that the temple must be torn down is not blasphemy because that's not God's house. He doesn't live there. He doesn't reside there. When God appeared to Moses near Mount Sinai in the flame of the burning thorn bush, the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet for the place, and we could insert there, in Midian, in the land of the Gentiles, is what? Holy ground. The holy place was not Jerusalem. It's called, you'll hear anytime Jerusalem is referred to now, it'll be the holy city of Jerusalem. It's not a holy city, it's a city. And as Stephen emphasizes, it was a mountain in Gentile territory where this took place. So the only reason that ground was holy was because God chose to be there. There was nothing and there never will be anything spiritually significant about a particular place on this earth. Now, so hopefully at this point, you're seeing Stephen's drift here. You're seeing what he's laying out before them. And you can bet that the Sanhedrin were beginning to see it as well. Stephen, here's what he's saying. He's saying this, this neat little hold that you guys have on God, this, this little thing that makes God Jewish and not the God of the Gentiles as well, it's a corrupt thing and it's corrupting you. If you are faithful to the tradition of Abraham and of Joseph and Moses, it, it, if you were guided by what the scriptures tell you, then you would know that God is the God of all people and that you, you would know that, that God is the God of, of, the, of the nations. And just because you have been given these special privileges by God, you have this enormous responsibility that you've forsaken, and that is to be a light to the nations. So just as God is not confined to a nation, God's people aren't confined to one either. And just as God is everywhere and he has those who seek him in every nation. But Stephen has another point here to drive home in connection with Moses. He says, Moses was rejected by the people of Israel, not once, but twice. See, for one who was accused of speaking blasphemous words against Moses, 
Uh, Stephen seemed to have nothing really but, but praise for Moses. He, he, his first description of him back in verse 20 is his, he was lovely in the sight of God. Uh, and, you know, it, it's really kind of a reference to his character. It wasn't just, you know, a face a mother could love. We all think our babies are the cutest babies. He's, sends, he's saying more than that. He's saying his character was beautiful. There was something special about Moses from the very beginning. Moses was Israel's deliverer from bondage. So Stephen breaks down Moses' life into three blocks of 40 years. And the first 40 years are describing his growth into adulthood in verse 20, where he says, um, it was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. So here we see that, that Moses was trained according to the wisdom and the customs of Egypt. He was an Egyptian. So God in his providence raises Moses up as an Egyptian with all the understanding of Egypt's culture and Egypt's wisdom in preparation for what? To be the one who's going to deliver his people, which is actually Israel, from the Egyptians. He's going to understand them better than any Israelite could. So he was uniquely qualified to lead his people. And then he goes to the next 40 years in verse 23. He says, um, but when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. But they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together. And he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, men... You are brethren, why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? You don't mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? And at this remark, Moses fled, became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. So now he was, he was taking his stand for righteousness against an, unju- an injustice being done. He must have concluded, perhaps, that, that the time had come. Perhaps he had become aware of this 400 years that God told about Abraham, and he's like, maybe I'm the one. Maybe he's coming to this realization that I think I'm the one that's going to lead them out of bondage for 400 years. He, he, becomes, he reaches that point where he identifies now with his people, and he's uniquely trained to lead them. He must have thought all this. Surely this is the moment. I'm going to strike down this Egyptian in righteous indignation, and they're going to go, you're our leader. Did they do that? No. No. The people rejected him. And when, and the, when word of his actions got out, he, he feared Egypt, and they feared him. I mean, and, and Israel feared him. And so he fled. He fled to Midian, where he spent the next 40 years of his life. And finally, an account of Moses' leadership of Israel through the final 40 years is given. And and he begins with his appearing to Moses in verse 30 and and 33, which we already read. And then he continues with God sending Moses back into Egypt and on out through the Exodus. So note again that, that God went with him, even though he wasn't in the land. But in this passage, Stephen also turned up, turned up the heat here. He began to lay the foundation to make clear the hypocrisy of the Sanhedrin when it came to their professed loyalty to Moses. So look at verse 37. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him in their hearts and turned back to Egypt. See, Stephen recounts what in many ways was now he's about to go into what is the most infamous episode in the history of Israel the golden calf. And he argued, he argues on this basis that the nation was largely characterized by their rebellion 
not their faithfulness, their rebellion to all that Moses taught. Because here he is up on the mountain receiving the living oracles of God while the people are down playing, playing the harlot to false gods. And as bad as that rebellion was, the climax of this rebellion had only just happened. See, just as the Israelites had rejected Moses, and with that they'd rejected God, now we have the Sanhedrin, who he's standing before telling this story. And all the Jews in general really are in view here. They rejected who Moses spoke of. What did he say? He said, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. They had rejected this new and better Moses, as well as his messengers, Jesus Christ and his apostles. Stephen, he hadn't blasphemed Moses. He, he believes in Moses because in Moses, what do we have? A foreshadowing of Christ. Stephen's testimony proves that he believes in Moses. But did the council believe in Moses? See, that's what he's putting to them. Do you really believe in Moses? So the stage is set now. Stephen had, had turned the tables on his accusers. He's saying, in effect, it's not me, but you who are guilty of blasphemy. You failed to understand Moses just as you failed to understand Abraham. You failed to see the one to whom Moses pointed, and that was Christ. Now, there, there's one final piece of redemptive history that, that Stephen takes them in which, in which Stephen speaks about the tabernacle and the temple. Remember, this has all just been about Moses and the law. Now he's going to speak about the temple primarily. I take it back. It hasn't been about Moses and the law, but this is, this is another, another installment of his argument there. We've seen very clearly God doesn't reside in a place. They've made that, he's made that point already many times. And now he brings this point home to speak about the presence of God. And he starts in verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he'd seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations of whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? So Stephen's point in, the, in his whole message was that God is not confined to one location and that he's always been mobile with his glory. It's true that God chose the nation of Israel to be his people, but the Sanhedrin had lost sight of the fact that God chose Israel so that all the nations would ultimately be blessed in Christ. The prophet foretold by Moses, the greater one that would come up from among the people. The tabernacle was a means for God's glory to be manifested. The tabernacle in the wilderness, the mobile one that, he, that, that was first given to Moses. It was meant to manifest his glory mobily, go place to place. And it was for this reason that Joshua, after Moses' death, they carried it into the promised land. Now, I want you to notice something that Stephen says about the golden calf back in verse 41. The Israelites had rejected Moses. They turned to a golden calf, which Stephen calls was the work of their hands. That's a phrase which generally refers to the making of an idol. It's the work of their hands. Look what he says about the temple in verse 48. The Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. Do you, do you see the connection that Stephen is making between the golden calf and the temple? The place, the, the nation of Israel had come to idolize the temple. The place became more important than the presence of God. In fact, according to, if you go back and read Ezekiel 10, the glory of the Lord had departed 
from the temple that Solomon built. This is the temple of Herod, rebuilt. It never says that the glory of the Lord ever came back. And they don't even notice. God's presence isn't even there. They continue on with their ritual. They continue on with their sacrifices. And it has nothing to do with God. Can you imagine how this searing indictment must have enraged Stephen's accusers as they listened to him? And to sum up his speech, Stephen showed from biblical history that, that God had never been confined either to a particular place or even to a particular people. Further, those to whom he had revealed himself, they had a history of rejecting his revelation. And at the heart of their blindness was a failure to see Moses as a deliverer, as a savior. Whatever function the law had given, had been, of, the, of the law given at Sinai had in the purposes of God, there was a greater purpose for which it served. It wasn't just to create a moral people. No, it had an even greater purpose, that of preparing the people of God for a deliverance from what Egypt had merely pictured. What was the picture of the deliverance in, in Egypt? Egypt, they were delivered from physical bondage, but it was merely a picture for the greater deliverance by the greater Moses, a deliverance from spiritual bondage to sin. It was Paul who declared what the Israelites had failed to see. Paul who's standing there ready to hold the coats while folks kill Stephen at this point. But later he said, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The end, the fulfillment. Christ is the fulfillment of righteousness that we see in the law. Only Christ could fulfill the law. You can't fulfill the law. All the aspects of the law, its moral laws, its judicial laws, its ceremonial laws, they were ultimately pointers to the coming of Jesus Christ who would fulfill them and thereby make them no longer necessary. That's why we don't follow the law. Christ fulfilled it for us. God signaled this when he, he, he made this declaration clear when in the temple, at the time of Christ's death, the veil to the holiest place was torn in two. There is no more holy place. My son has died in fulfillment of the law. The author of Hebrews, he emphasizes this same point in Hebrews 10, 14. He says, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, not the very form of things, it can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, it can never make perfect those who draw near. And then jumping down to verse 4, he says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. He says, it was a picture and you missed the picture. And so the accused becomes the accuser. And he says in verse 51, You men, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit, you are doing as your fathers did. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You have received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Four things he says you're guilty of. Re you rebelled against the prophets of God. You restricted the presence of God. You refused to keep the law of God. And worst of all, you rejected and killed the righteous son of God. They chose instead to hold to this outward form of the law and the traditions that had arisen surrounding it, but they failed to see what the law had all along been designed to accomplish. And again, we turn to Paul to sum it up in Galatians 3.23. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor, to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified, not by our works, by faith. God gave the law to drive men and women to the end of themselves so they wouldn't trust in their works. You can't keep it, can you? 
If you think you can keep the law, you've got a pretty low view of what keeping the law means. No, it's to drive you to that point, that realization, I can't be good enough before God. And at the heart of the gospel lies the truth, you cannot save yourself. You can't do it. God rejects all who trust in the work of their hands. Anything that you fashion, whether it be your deeds, whether it be what you think you are because you're a member of a church or you've been baptized or whatever, that's a work of your hands. And if you think that can save you, you're making that your God. You're idolizing something. It's the work of your hands. But what has he provided you? He's provided you something far better. The perfect righteousness of his son. He offers it to you. And have you acknowledged this for yourself? Have you? Are you you resisting as we see the Sanhedrin doing? Are, Are you trusting in your own works? Or will, you do, or, will you, or will you yield to the truth that there's only one Savior of sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ? That's it. He is the only way. So Stephen's accusers had rejected the gospel. And like their fathers before them, the prophet who was greater than Moses, the righteous one, the Messiah whom God had sent into the world on behalf of sinners. And the Sanhedrin, he, he marched them right back up into a corner and they were faced with a choice now. Either admit that Stephen was correct. They were wrong in crucifying Christ. Or be consistent and kill Stephen also. And that's what they chose. Look at uh, 54. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. They were pierced. They knew the truth of what was being proclaimed before them because it came right out of their word. But they began gnashing their teeth at him, being full of the Holy Spirit. He gazed intently into heaven. He saw the glory of God. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice. They covered their ears. They rushed at him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. So in this murderous frenzy, following the customary method of stoning, what they probably did is they tied his hands behind his back, they took him to a high place, and they cast him down to the ground below. And when they saw that he was still alive, they began throwing large rocks at him until he died. But in a supernatural manifestation of grace, he even cries out, just as Jesus did, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then what does he proceed on to do? Just like Jesus, he intercedes on their behalf. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then he died. And it says he died in peace. How do we know that? He fell asleep. It's a beautiful description of the death of a believer. Precious in the sight of God is the death of his godly ones. Indeed, this was precious. Because look what's highlighted by Luke. What what does Stephen see? as he gazes into heaven, as this murderous frenzy is, 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 is gathering around him, he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What's, what's so significant about this? Well, remember what Scripture tells us where Jesus is at right now? Seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe the significance here is that Jesus was, was now serving as Stephen's advocate. He was confessing him before the Father in response to Stephen confessing him before men, just as Jesus said he would in Matthew 10. It's it's wonderful to know that that Christ, Christ stands with and for his servants. And the inclusion of Saul's name in verse 58, that's deliberate. Luke inserted his name. There was plenty of folks there, but he wants you to know who also is there. Saul, the man who would soon be saved. He'd be transformed into the apostle Paul. In fact, from chapter 13 of this book onward, he takes center stage in what's beginning right here 
the world mission of the church because the church is going to turn outward from Jerusalem now because the persecution has just been turned up. This Pharisee of the Pharisees would soon come to appreciate that the old covenant was not about the land. It wasn't about the law. It wasn't about the liturgy, but rather it was about his Lord and Savior. And he would spend the rest of his life proclaiming him. As the, as the late second, early third century theologian Tertullian noted, he said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So what appeared by everyone who knew about this as a setback for the church. It actually became the means for the further expansion of the church. Stephen's courage to be bold in the face of his accusers, it would, it would go on to encourage countless Christians. Have you been encouraged this morning? It continues to encourage the saints of God. I want to tell you about one of them in particular, though, a man by the name of Thomas Cranmer. And I'll conclude with this story here. 450 years ago or so, a little more than that now, March 21st, 1556, a crowd of curious spectators packed University Church in Oxford, England. They were to witness the public recantation of one of the most well-known English reformers, a man named Thomas Cranmer. Cranmer had been arrested by Roman Catholic authorities nearly three years earlier. And at first, his resolve was strong. But after many months in prison, under daily pressure from his captors and the imminent threat of being burned at the stake, this reformer's faith had faltered. His enemies eventually coerced him to sign several documents renouncing his Protestant faith. In a moment of weakness, in order to prolong his life, Cranmer denied the truths that he had defended throughout his ministry, the very principles upon which the Reformation itself was based. The Roman Catholic Queen, Mary I, otherwise known to the church as Bloody Mary, viewed Cranmer's retractions as a mighty trophy in her violent campaign against the Protestant curse, cause. Excuse me. But, but Cranmer's enemies wanted more than just a written recantation. We want you to say it out loud, and we want you to do it in public. And so on March 21st, 1556, Thomas Cranmer was taken from prison. He was brought to the university church. He was dressed in tattered clothing, uh, the very weary, broken, and degraded reformer. He took his place at the pulpit. A script of his public recantation had already been approved, and his enemies sat expectantly in the audience, eager to hear this clear denunciation of the evangelical faith. But then the unexpected happened. In the middle of his speech, Thomas Cranmer deviated from his script. To the shock and to the dismay of his enemies, he refused to recant the true gospel. And instead, he bravely recanted his earlier recantation. So finding the courage that he had lacked over the previous months, the emboldened reformer announced to the crowd of shocked onlookers, I come to the great thing that troubles my conscience more than anything I have ever said or did in my life, and that is the setting abroad of writings contrary to the truth which here now I renounce and refuse. As things written in my hand which were contrary to the truth which I thought in my heart being written for fear of death and to save my life. And Cranmer went on to say that if he should be burned at the stake, his right hand would be the first to be destroyed since it had signed those recantations. And then just to make sure that no one misunderstood him, Cranmer added this, and as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and antichrist with all his false doctrine. And then chaos ensued. They rushed him. They grabbed him. They dragged him out of the, the university church and they burned him at the stake. And true to his word, he thrust his right hand into the flames so that it might be destroyed first. And as the flames encircled his body, Cranmer died with the words of Stephen on his lips. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I see the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God.
what great and glorious truths we traffic in this morning. We honor Stephen and his memory for his courage and example. But it was not Stephen's courage that was displayed. It was the courage of Christ, the wisdom of Christ, the character of Christ. And I ask all who hear me praying to you, Lord, I ask them, have you received the righteousness of Christ? can't stand on your own. You can't stand before a holy God with anything but the righteousness of Christ. And to that we cling. And it is enough. It is more than enough. You've taken my sin and you've given me your righteousness. And we praise you for this. Lord, drive home within us these truths of the gospel. For this is where we stand. This is the hill to die on, the gospel. For no matter what's going on in our culture around us, this is what we must preach and this is what we must defend even with our lives. For it is a glorious, eternal truth. So do your work in us, Spirit of God, for the glory of Christ. Amen. Let's stand. To love lowly man before any star could herald your praise. And why did you come abasing yourself, veiled in a robe of frail human clay? Why would you, the pure, give your life for the vile, the innocent seeking the guilty to be reconciled?